think the cat wants to come in. Well, maybe she's happy. Where she is. Mm -hmm. He or she. <coughs> to welcome you today because I feel we've landed <laughs> we're accommodating the space really nicely and, uh, I'm starting to notice the sense of ease and well-being increase hopefully uh, that's just not within myself but it's also a reflection of your own increasing well-being and ease even a little bit <laughs> because Really, the relationships are often reciprocal and we need relationships to thrive. The whole life can be seen as relationship. And as I said yesterday, although we don't have to develop method to ourself in order to succeed, we can begin with a love person. But still, if we have that sense of self-respect, self-esteem, if you like, and a healthy sense of self, then generally speaking, it's easier for us to build respectful and healthy, loving relationships with others as well. You can be mirrors to others and they can be mirrors back to us. So It's beautiful when we're practicing this together. It feels different from practicing alone. So today I wanted to talk a little bit more about loving kindness and the practice of loving kindness as a way as a vehicle really into the deep states of meditation called jhana. Um, and that's really what Brahma Vihara means. So metta is one of the four Brahma Viharas which mean divine abidings. And those divine abidings literally mean a kind of union or um, an entry into the Brahma realm which is a sort of uh, a realm of beings who dwell happily. They're also known as the happy abidings. And uh, interestingly, it's also the realm that's beyond uh, the five senses. So in one of the suttas, it says that we develop these states until they're limitless and unbounded. Um, they radiate in all four directions, to the north, south, east and west, above and below, exalted, boundless, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. And the simile in the suttas is like a, a trumpeter who is uh, perhaps standing on a mountain. I remember being in Ladakh at about 3,200 metres. That's just the capital town of Leh. But you can walk up from there to a palace even higher. And we did that in the first day that I was there. And uh, I'm pretty sure you could hear the conch shells from the different monasteries uh, just resounding throughout the valley in every direction. And in the same way, the Buddha says, uh, this metta, this loving kindness, can extend itself just limitlessly and no residual karma of the sense world will remain. So that means at that time you are literally um, abiding in a different realm and that it becomes your character, you become suffused with loving kindness and also your destination. So when you die you're very likely to take rebirth there. Whether or not you uh, think of rebirth as something that happens after death, you can be reborn there, if you like, whenever your mind has loving kindness. Yeah, it's a rebirth from uh, the ill will that we carry around with us. It's a temporary relief. And it's powerful. It can cut through that old karma that is uh, a cause for our suffering. So these are really happy states the pleasant abidings here and now. So, so far we've mostly talked about loving kindness as a, not only, but we've talked about it as an attitude, as a way of relating to ourselves, to each other, to our bodies. Medi uh, meta meditation can be used to heal uh, sicknesses and disease. Usually not uh, intentionally, but sometimes as an unexpected side effect. So we develop genuine loving kindness and amazingly it can unblock certain uh, maybe blocked energies or old traumas in the body um, and can lead to healing. I remember 
several years ago. It's probably the same story I told last time because I haven't had another big sickness since then. But uh, I had a melanoma on my arm. I've got a really cool scar now. It's like Forest Nam, yay. <laughs> Tough Forest Nam, superpower Forest Nam. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, it's a nice big scar. <laughs> And that was really interesting because when I was diagnosed, um, it was a bit scary. It was the weekend, so I couldn't phone anywhere up. I couldn't kind of phone up the various, I don't know, skin clinics to have it uh, taken out. So I had to just sit with it and watch it grow, and it was really a bit freaky. And uh, I remember simultaneously shifting between a sense of almost visceral fear, like sort of very subtle tremors that would come through the body from time to time, realising, gosh... You can die from these things, you know. And then it would alternate with this feeling of overwhelming love, which really took me by surprise. It was also faced with the fragility of my life and the uncertainty of that. The natural response was this sense of the preciousness of life and the miracle of being alive and, I guess, tuning in to the love that I tried to live with And I had the feeling that, yeah, my life is really valuable, really valuable, even though sometimes I was struggling at that time with a big project and not much support at all, feeling quite displaced really over here. So it led to that feeling of uh, amazement and joy and love that was very strong. And then uh, I went to Perth after having it taken off about a week later, so still with a big wound and bandage and all. And uh, for some reason, the doctors had told me to leave it on, so I kind of did what I was told for once and left it on. (laughs) And it went infected. And uh, it was a big mess, just as they were about to take the stitches out, so they couldn't take them out. And uh, I remember just sitting down to meditate, and I practiced loving-kindness. Ajahn Brown said, don't practice it directing it to the wound straight away, just practice it until it's really strong. And then you can direct it there if you wish. And I was so uh, taken with this metta meditation, maybe because it was really necessary. I was sitting there, and about three and a half hours passed, and I thought, where's the afternoon gone? (laughs) And I was really full of love and kindness. I mean, full means sometimes it's not an intense experience. It can just be a sense of softness, almost like you're floating on cotton wool or on clouds. Um, A kind of fuzziness and a sense of great well-being that obviously uh, kept me kept me engaged for all that time but then the next day I noticed it was a little bit better and the next day a little bit better and I have to admit there were antibiotics involved as well but until that meta meditation there wasn't really much healing going on and I just wonder you know I think it's quite possible that meta has that effect so, But we don't practice it for that reason, because again, we can lose the unconditionality of metta that way. You know, I'll practice metta so long as I get this wonderful experience, so long as my sickness is relieved. And the same thing when we choose a loved person. So we already started with ourselves, and uh, as we many of us have found out, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to generate loving kindness for ourselves. Somehow... Instead of being our own advocates, we become our own worst critics because we see all our little so-called faults. And maybe we've had them pointed out unfairly as well and they become exaggerated in our minds. But with ourselves too, we can develop a a certain closeness and empathy and learn to encourage and advocate for ourselves. Realise we are deserving of our own love and the love of others too. And... uh, We don't always have to make unfair demands or accept them from other people. But the love person is generally easier. And I think four years ago when I was here, we started with the love person for that reason. Um, It's almost like the sweet spot of loving kindness because we have natural feelings already of love towards that person. And I do hope everybody managed to settle with someone. It doesn't have to be your only choice because different subjects sometimes elicit different responses and we can't necessarily predict how that's going to work. Sometimes the closest people are not the easiest because we have more history with them. Sometimes it's a person who's 
not so close, but maybe has just helped you in some way that's significant recently. Like when I did my first uh, properly guided meta retreat several years ago, I, I chose as my love person the person that had sponsored the retreat. And she was a friend who I'd lived with. She was an Anagarika at the time in, in a monastery over here. And uh, her face just was in my mind with this huge smile nearly the whole retreat. And I just settled with her. And uh, the loving kindness flowed so easily and because it also felt like an opportunity to give. And being someone who does tend to enjoy giving more than receiving, um, which I think most people do once they get a taste for it, it felt like a huge motivation to practice. Sometimes when we're practicing and we feel like it's for ourselves, we're not that motivated, especially if we don't have a good relationship of self-love with ourselves. We think, well, I'm doing this for me, but I'm not that important. I'll just do it because I should, and, you know, it's important, and uh, make me a better person, blah, 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 right? <coughs> but, <laughs> but when we think of actually the practice as, as a service, as a giving, as a gift, for me, that becomes really powerful. I can really put myself into it much more. And the motivation for practice gets purified as well. We're practicing to give rather than to receive. And so in this case, it was really lovely because I felt I could give something back and share the retreat that she had helped me um, receive, all the teachings and the beautiful location, which was somewhere in Italy with beautiful smells of spring flowers. And it was a really wonderful experience but in the back I also had my superpower object which was my first preceptor uh, Sayadaw Upanyajota he was my preceptor in Myanmar and similar to the way I came in contact with Ajahn Brahm I actually just heard of him before I met him and I had this feeling this is it I found finally after 10 years of searching I found the place to ordain and I was literally jumping up and down when I heard about this person because I knew this is going to be my teacher. So, uh, and he always showered me with metta, tangibly so, that I would feel it through the whole body without having to make any effort at all. So it was almost as though sitting in his presence to meditate for those first four years of my monastic life, big blessing, uh, I would just be suffused by metta and already begin the meditation from a place where there was so much well-being and so much a sense of safety and PT. PT means a kind of um, pure kind of happiness, rapture, that is uh, felt through the body and mind. That kind of subtle, pleasant sensation that sometimes comes up in the practice of metta. So I would feel I was starting from that place just by the power of being around this person. So... I would have him in mind for whenever the metta would slightly weaken because metta, like everything else, takes time to build up and it has its fluctuations. Um, I was reading recently, or I think just it came to mind, this quote, and I checked it out today, who said it? I think it was Shakespeare. Love is not love which, alterate, which alters when it alteration finds. And that's from one of Shakespeare's verses, and it got quite criticised, actually, because it's true of exalted, real, unconditional love in a state of deep samadhi, but for most of the time, loving-kindness, even in its pure, even, you know, coming from, say, an enlightened person, it will change and adapt according to the situation. But, of course, it is far less conditional, less conditioned than any other um, experience we've had so far most probably so I would use him to kind of boost the meta whenever it felt like it was flagging just for a few minutes because I noticed if I used um, if I brought that person to mind too much it would almost be too intense and I didn't want to exploit it you know <laughs> it was like sweeties you can't have too many sweeties or you get sick <laughs> so don't eat too much chocolate I don't know if you have chocolate. I shouldn't mention it because you might not have chocolate. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's okay because sweeties make you sick. So it's better to go for the whole food, <laughs> the whole grain, whatever. So, uh, yeah, so with um, establishing the right motivation for practicing loving kindness, we have to keep the unconditional aspect of love in mind. And when we spread metta to the love person, even though we may truly wish for them to find more peace, more happiness, maybe be free from disease. 
we don't practice it for that reason. We don't practice it to change the other, even if that's in a positive way. We practice it to change our own heart. We practice it to purify our own mind and to beautify our mind. I love that word, beautify the mind. Sometimes in the suttas it says um, uh, qualities like metta, qualities like generosity, um, adorn the mind uh, or equip the mind with serenity and with insight. So again, these states are cultivated, samadhi is cultivated for the purpose of seeing things clearly, seeing things as they truly are. So um, again, it's not the ultimate goal of, of Buddhism, but it's a very powerful means and a very resourcing, beautiful, uh, beneficial quality to, to cultivate. So um, yeah, it's also related to the third noble truth, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Noble Truths in Buddhism. Hopefully everybody. Uh, I did notice there was a little uh, kind of folder in everybody's room with basic Buddhism and it said about the first Noble Truth of suffering. I don't know if they actually modified that to mean dissatisfaction, but you know, in the Buddhist text it's pretty clear that it goes all the way from the suffering of death, the suffering of the loss of loved ones. That's really heavy suffering. And also, of course through the whole range, from discontent, mild discontent, mild irritation, the simply not getting what we want, you know. I don't know, do you still feel that sometimes? I still, <laughs> you sometimes get that feeling like you're a child and you just want to have a tantrum, you know, because it didn't go your way. <laughs> you know, it's really suffering, isn't it, when you see little children and they don't understand why they can't have what they need right now. and They have a big tantrum and that frustrated want the end of the world at that time anyway the, so the suffering is there um, and suffering has to be understood and then the cause of suffering is the craving so with metta as I said we're not having any clinging towards outcome uh, we meditate just for the sake of it we practice loving kindness just for the beauty of that intention whether or not it reaps results that we can tangibly feel and experience we have that trust and we practice it to give, not to get. We practice it to give away uh, clinging, craving for outcome. Clinging or craving that a person fulfills our expectations of them or becomes our friend in return. You know, We don't want to uh, practice metta just because we want to be close to someone, for example. Although that closeness may naturally result. Um, simply because we hold them in our mind with such care. And when we meet them, we're likely to, uh, to relate to them as a friend because we've been giving them that extra attention, that extra um, thoughtfulness and care. But, uh, yeah, the metta itself doesn't ask for anything in return. It's giving without expecting anything back at all. Uh, my own teacher's favourite phrase for loving kindness is, um, the door of my heart is open to you no matter what you ever do. And it was really nice this year, as I said, we were travelling around for a couple of weeks, I organised these big tours and we reach usually around a thousand people, I'd say, throughout the uh, course of the tour. It may have been more this time, and all the people online, so it's an enormous amount of preparation and work that goes into it, at least six months, maybe longer, to plan all the venues and, and things. Um, and it's always pretty exhausting when he's here, but also very special because I get to hang out and uh, get to know my teacher as a human being that I can relate to on anything and ask questions about every aspect of my life and just have fun. Somebody mentioned, uh, I think it was you, you mentioned earlier that with the metta there comes a certain lightness and a certain playfulness and there's a lot of that happening <laughs> when we're together. So a lot of it's off camera. <laughs> Some of it, sometimes it's on camera and we do silly chants and it gets really really over the top and out of tune and it's very cute actually it's very playful and relaxed but one of the things we did this time was visit um his extended family so the sister no the daughter of the sister of his dad and so far i had always known that phrase the door of my heart is open no matter what you ever do it was usually attributed to his dad who showed my teacher Ajahn Brahm incredible love and kindness and unfortunately died when Ajahn Brahm was only 16. Um, 
But Adrian Brown always says he never grieved. He just felt uh, the same kind of feeling that you have when a concert ends. Just how fortunate he was, how grateful he was to have been there. What an amazing performance that was. And I really think that's invested him with a sense of wonder and incredible love. Yeah, sometimes the loss can, can impart that sense of uh, amazement and, and gratitude for what we've had. So anyway, it was always attributed to him. But when we went to visit his family, his dad's sister's daughter was there. And she said that um, her mother, who was his dad's older sister, used to say, the door of my heart's open to you no matter what. She's mm-hmm. from Liverpool, but I can't do Liverpool, Julian. Mm-hmm. But she'd be like, my love is unconditional. Mm-hmm. Unconditional. <laughs> and it was just so nice to hear that that had filtered down from you know the big sister to his dad and then to this great mm-hmm. teacher who is now sharing his loving kindness with Millions of people around the world. He's the Theravadan Dalai Lama. <laughs> or the Theravadan Thich Nhat Hanh, let's say. Yeah, the same kind of uh, magnitude, really. And, uh, and it's genuine when you're around these beings. But it is conditioned, and I thought it was very cool that it actually came from a woman. <laughs> because it's quite an unusual thing for a father to say. But it is that a sort of uh, all-encompassing loving-kindness that doesn't change when it alteration finds. At least, uh, you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't stop, it doesn't diminish. Yeah. But loving-kindness is uh, one response. One way that loving kindness expresses itself is metta. And I did say that I'd touch on the other Brahma Viharas as well because these are all exalted states um, that can spread in all directions and bring about a feeling of bliss and sublime peace. So the second one is compassion. The third one is mudita, which is sometimes translated as sympathetic joy. I think of it more like a rejoicing joy because it really is a celebratory, rejoicing kind of uplifting quality of mind. And then the last one is equanimity. And uh, people often wonder about this because sometimes equanimity is portrayed as being quite cool and aloof. But actually as a Brahma Vihara, it's certainly a divine abiding. And to me, it seems like another expression of love. So... Sometimes they're described as uh, interrelated qualities like lattices that kind of relate and overlap. Sometimes they're described just as love's response to different situations. So we generate loving kindness first because it's the easiest and the most all-encompassing. But then when love meets suffering, it naturally morphs into compassion. And that's the best way that I've been able to understand compassion. It can be a practice in and of itself, but in my experience it can come about simply through a change in the subject. So, for example, I was once meditating, generating loving kindness to my best friend. And then, after a while, I changed the object to someone who I know in Burma, a very old lady who'd been through quite some hardships in her life, including the loss of a child. And uh, later on, actually, since then, she lost another child, a grown adult, because she must be in her 80s by now. So she'd really ha- gone through a lot of suffering, very poor, the kind of woman who's really had to work very hard for what she has, and, um, and yet gives so much, and she was one of my main supporters. She'd come into the city if I was sick, for example, and I'd travel three hours from my monastery, she'd travel about two hours from her home, and she'd give me like a little tiffin, you know, a tin, and she'd have put not just rice but some prawns or something because at that time I I was vegetarian and sadly I can't be fully vegetarian anymore but um, that was something that could settle my stomach because I was really finding it hard to keep anything inside at all and this was food that she wouldn't afford for herself you know and she'd travel all that way and it just felt like the gift of a deva you know an angel if you like So anyway, I was practicing loving kindness to her and then it started to transmute, I guess, or just adapt itself to something that I recognized as compassion. And that showed me the wisdom of love. 
you know, that it has this capacity to adapt to the situation, which is why I say it does change, it does transmute according to what's needed. But sometimes loving kindness is not the appropriate response. If somebody's crying, if somebody's just lost a child or you know, or whatever they're going through, a sense of shame maybe. Someone mentioned this is an experience that we all go through from time to time. I think it's deeply ingrained in this kind of uh, Christian culture that we're somehow inherently flawed. Sometimes loving kindness is not the right response. May you be happy when you're not. It's like, well, I'm not. Can you accept me how I am, you know? So sometimes the response that's needed is... uh, May you hold this suffering kindly, you know, may you feel, may you be able to welcome this hurt. And, uh, yeah, may you come out of your suffering, might be the appropriate response, but it's a different feel. And then the mudita is a kind of love that rejoices in another person's success. And that's considered slightly harder because of this habit we have of competition, envy, miserliness. Sometimes it's called the opposite of jealousy, mudita. But I think it can also be the opposite of miserliness, like a kind of meanness of spirit that you don't really want people to be doing better than you because that makes you feel less. But loving kind, uh, mudita, love's response to people who are happy, kind of invites us to rejoice with them. And that's beautiful because it means we can share in the happiness of the world. How often do you share in the suffering of the world, reading in the newspapers? I mean, and it's valid, right? There's a lot of terrible problems. There's a genocide going on in Gaza. There is a genocide going on in Myanmar. There's the war in Ukraine. You know, there are so many problems in the world. Corrupt politicians, you know, racism, you name it, it's there and you'll find it if you look. But there's also a whole lot of good that never makes it on the front page. It doesn't make it anywhere. Actually, it made it on the front page of a monast- <laughs> of one of the local papers in Australia. Not much goes on in the backwaters and <laughs> there's this tiny monastery like in the south of Western Australia. It's a bunch of the main monastery. There's two monks, one, res- one full-time and one that stays with him a lot of the time. And they're on the front newspaper, mm-hmm. <laughs> front of the paper locally. Um, especially when Ajahn Brown comes to town, there's a big article about it. Oh, people came and they received, you know, people came and listened to these talks about happiness and how to live a compassionate life. And it's like, wow, amazing. But we don't normally hear about, you know, the barn retreat in, in I don't know, what you have here, the Totnes Times or something. <laughs> you know, why not? I mean, it's amazing. Right, we ate beautiful vegetables from the garden today for like the third day. <laughs> you know, people made wonderful food for us, people treat each other with kindness and consideration. We never hear about these things, but it's happening. So, Medita invites us to rejoice, and then equanimity is a kind of uh, understanding that even though we can give our love, we can do our best to care for one another in the appropriate way, still. People do have to go through the ups and downs of life. They have to um, experience loss and uh, despair from time to time. Sometimes depression that lasts for years. Sometimes it doesn't seem so impermanent, you know. And um, that doesn't mean we don't care, but sometimes we have to accept that another person's suffering and, and try to keep a perspective on that, that people have their own paths to follow, to travel, and hopefully... Among that suffering, there are lessons to learn. And we just wish that they have the strength to go through that. We do our best to help. But eventually, um, equanimity may be the appropriate response. Keeping an even mind in the face of happiness and suffering within ourselves and in the world outside. So these are the Brahma Viharas in brief. But um, coming back to the loving kindness, which is what we really want to cultivate now, Although I do invite you to make use of compassion from time to time if you are going through a difficult time. Um, I'd like to talk a bit more about how we practice the loving kindness. So you've had a few hints already in the guided meditation. But to give a bit of historical background. um, In the early Buddhist texts, that's where the beautiful simile of the trumpet was found. 
Um, the emphasis tends to be more on spreading loving kindness impartially in all directions. So it's this sense of spatial expansion more than the person, the object who you're generating it to. That's less important and the, the idea is to spread to all beings. And it's from this perception of all beings that the mind can find oneness, that there can be a sense of unity and one that can then result in uh, jhanas, med deep meditation, um, the mind coming to one point, but it's a very inclusive, expansive state. It, that's why the word concentration doesn't really do it, because that implies a narrow focus, and loving-kindness and breath meditation, actually, when we can really allow the PT in and we can really allow the mind to relax into stillness, becomes a very expanded state that includes rather than excludes um, an experience but perhaps it takes longer to cultivate in the sense that we are really working with our stuff you know, we're not excluding it and focusing in and using force to get to some exalted state we're actually working with what's there and allowing things to settle in time and to come to that naturally and of course the meta really helps with that it helps us to include everything in our mental and emotional landscape with the right attitude towards it so um, we spread that to all quarters and we spread it above and below to all as to oneself. So it suggests a certain evenness that we come to the stage where loving kindness doesn't discriminate. It doesn't even discriminate against ourself. <laughs> it doesn't stigmatize any, any of our emotions, you know, you're not allowed, you're, you are allowed, I don't mind the happy states, I don't like the angry states, anger's bad, I was told so when I was a little boy or a little girl, we just include it all and we stop um, discriminating against ourselves, but that's a very um, lofty aim and so this is why most teachers of metta start from the commentaries, which uh, are described in the Visuddhimagga. And in the Visuddhimagga commentaries, um, they do uh, discuss this practice that goes stage by stage. So it's a systematic and very thorough approach to reaching the same point of being able to spread metta indiscriminately to all. But generally speaking, we start with the oneself, as we've discussed and as we practiced yesterday. And, um, and then we move on to the benefactor. So I don't know how many people here have someone that they could consider a benefactor. It could be, if you're fortunate enough to have loving parents, it could be a parent, it could be an older sibling, a friend, it could be a teacher if you're lucky enough. Uh, maybe not even someone you know, but someone who's helped you from a distance. I know some of you do come from particular lineages and have teachers you respect, so that's wonderful. And it can also be um, a deity or a, um, what else can you call those things? I don't know, in Christianity, idols? I don't know. Because <laughs> I don't really, I, I like real people. That's just my nature. I can relate more, I guess, to the Sangha as a refuge even than the Buddha in many ways. Because I can have a direct living relationship. But the Buddha is often overlooked as a benefactor. And actually, once we get into the early Buddhist texts and start to have a relationship with the Buddha, start to understand the Buddha's words and how they apply to our lives now, that can become an incredibly powerful refuge. And I often picture myself with the Buddha in front of me and imagine how he would regard whatever it is that I'm experiencing, you know. Sometimes we can get stuck with our experiences and think, oh, this is the end of the world. But if you could see those experiences through the eyes of a Buddha, that would be really no big deal. He's seen it all. He's been there, done that through many lifetimes. He's really seen it all. Nothing could shock or surprise a Buddha or a teacher who's wise. So that's the benefactor, and as I said, uh, usually it's someone we have a great respect, even a sense of reverence towards, um, and it can also be someone we know quite well. And then we go to the love person, and uh, that's what we were practicing this afternoon. So the love person is someone we usually share interests in common with, we have um, maybe some history with, 
They know us, they've seen us, they see our goodness. I have a wonderful best friend who um, I grew up with from the age of four, and she just knows me. You know how it feels just to be known, to be seen? You don't have to explain things, you know. You don't have to... um, She can interpret your experience in the light of what she knows. So if I say that I'm struggling with someone or that certain emotions are coming up, she'll realise, oh, it must mean blah, blah, blah. Like, she wouldn't just say it lightly or, you know, or... It's, it's just different, and we find we can really confide in a person like that because they will see what we say in context, knowing our history, knowing who we are. So the love person is a really, really lovely object to work with. Um, it can still bring up clinging sometimes and can bring up stories, you know, if we know them too well. So, of course, there can be other loved ones too. Friends. We don't have to like have a really intense, passionate kind of... Because passion doesn't have to be sexual. It can just it be an intensity. It doesn't have to be too intense. It can be anyone we have friendly feelings towards. And then from there, once the fire is going, um, we can move towards a neutral person. And this is where meta starts to be really effective. Because we're trying to get to a stage of loving kindness that really does include everyone equally. And when we practice with a person who we don't have a lot of shared interests with or a lot of association with, there's not that much vested interest in their well-being. And that sounds a little bit selfish, doesn't it? Sometimes it's just because we haven't considered them very much. But it does show us where our love is still quite conditional, you know, on a person uh, fulfilling a certain need in our life. Because the neutral person doesn't fulfil any such need. They may be a near stranger, you know, someone in the sh- at the shop, corner shop, or someone you kind of read about maybe, I don't know, maybe even a public figure that you don't really care much about and, you know, you don't give much thought to. And when you hear a bit more about their life or when you consider their own humanity in the light of your own, suddenly you realise, oh, you know, maybe they're going through something too. I always remember this person um, in one of the monasteries that uh, I didn't have much to do with. I guess she was kind of neutral. And I tried to be friendly and uh, establish a relationship, but she was always a bit offhand. And then one day I found out that she'd lost a child earlier in her life. And uh, I haven't had children. But maybe it's through seeing my mother's very intense love and attachment or maybe it's something in a past life when I hear that I usually cry I usually can't imagine how that must feel and uh, you know I guess I do have a very strong sense of having lived many lives before (laughs) and I think we've probably all been through these things somehow or can at least imagine and it was interesting to see that when I um, realised that then a lot of compassion and loving kindness arose and I thought oh isn't it interesting that I had to know that in order for those feelings to arise because we can assume when we look at any one of us you know that we've all been through some sadness some sorrow in our lives and it's not quantifiable it's not like well you know being depressed in your teens is nothing everyone goes through that it's not quantifiable it's not related even to our level of uh, standard of living Apparently, beyond basic needs being met, the amount of income we earn does not equate to an increase in happiness. It's very interesting. I heard the figure was around $35,000 or pounds, but apparently it's not, it's less. It's just your basics being met. And beyond that, it doesn't make much difference, which would make sense, wouldn't it? (laughs) So, yeah... Sorry, I got distracted because I'm, I'm empathising with you need to sleep and also <laughs> <laughs> hoping that you didn't mind being woken up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the happiness doesn't increase that way. Um, yeah, that was for the neutral person, right? So we don't have a lot of um, vested interest necessarily. And, and for that reason, when the meta comes forth and when it does start to flourish towards a so-called neutral person, it's actually very genuine. And it can feel very clean as well. 
can feel quite close to unconditional care and love. And amazingly, that can actually engender a different relationship as well, because you've been thinking about them, and it's likely that when you meet them, there'll be that sense of goodwill. And it's amazing how people can pick it up. You know, it's kind of magical, because as I said, we don't practice to engender close relationships or um, create connections necessarily, but it can happen as a result. And uh, there are different theories around it, you know, whether it's just the fact that you're giving them attention, the fact that... uh, uh, you might have a different disposition towards them, but it can also be an energetic thing, that there is such a thing as positive energy. Energy. I mean, I think we can feel it. I can certainly feel that if I enter a room where a lot of goodness is being um, developed or if you enter a place that's really dodgy, like a pub, which I haven't entered in <laughs> 30 years, I don't know, a long time. But it just feels, you know, it feels icky. Even the weather can have an effect, can't it? I don't know. I think sunshine really lightens people's mood. So anyway, the metta starts to become a little bit uh, less conditional when we enter the neutral terrain. And then the last one is the disliked person or a person we find difficult because these categories are malleable. They change. As I said, the neutral person can actually end up becoming a friend. A friend can drop out of friendship with us, can't they, and become even an enemy. If uh, if things go wrong, um, and but with the disliked person or the person we find difficult, it's almost like the the culmination of our practice. This is where you really get to put your meta to good use. It's like yes, this is the purpose of meta to overcome ill will. So when the disliked person comes to mind, and this is when we I mean, our meta is already quite strong, um, we really get a chance to see its power and to see its capacity to heal and to overcome ill will. And this is, in a sense, one of the main, or at least preliminary purposes of loving kindness. And I think it's great to go through this sequence in our lives. We might not get to it to this retreat, and I would definitely encourage people to uh, not to push themselves. You might just want to stay with a loved person or stay with yourself even just stay with your body, you know. It's not just stay with your body. It's not like there's a hierarchy here. Whatever is good for you in this retreat. But if we can sometimes practice with uh, the difficult person, we really can start to see results. And I remember in one of the Zoom sessions, I was doing like Metta every week for the pretty much the whole pandemic and also giving Dhamma talks and Metta chanting every week. So a lot of teaching through that whole time. Um, and one time we did a meta meditation uh, and included the difficult person and this uh, one participant was so excited at the end she said oh, my meta got stronger when I got to the difficult person it was amazing it really took off it's like it just came up in response to this uh, ill will and it became really strong and she was really she was I think in tears around this because it was just such a release so this is when metta starts to work at the roots, you know, by uprooting um, greed and hatred from the heart. So this is how it can be a very powerful method into samadhi because we can't get into those deep states of meditation when there's a hindrance is present, you know, the hindrance of greed or hate or uh, ill will, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, drowsiness. Um, although that's not such a terrible um, barrier, sometimes we just really do need to sleep and resource ourselves before we can practice. And then the restlessness, of course, is, goes away when we start to enjoy the practice, when we start to be able to really stay with uh, something more pleasant. Um, we start to become content where we are and the restlessness fades. And then the doubt about what we're doing and where it's leading starts to fade when we see the results. You know, doubt is also a hindrance. So, when those hindrances, uh, when the hindrance of doubt fades, we can be much more sure about the path, about our experience, about what we see, and realize whatever we're seeing, we're seeing through a clearer lens than usual. So, it might be closer to the truth of how things are. So, yeah, one more thing I wanted to add about practicing metta to the difficult person, which might be ourself sometimes, right? 
It can be ourself as well. Um, it's important to give room to emotions like sadness and grief and uh, anger, you know, in whatever form that comes. Because sometimes under the anger is actually a deep sense of grief, sadness, tenderness. Um, and again, compassion might be the most appropriate response. You know, may I hold this with kindness? May I be with myself with tender loving care? May my suffering be released? So maybe not may I be happy. It might not resonate quite, quite that well. And it's when we give these things room and space to be and we can meet them with these beautiful qualities of loving kindness and compassion and sometimes equanimity as well, that's when we can heal. If we don't give them space, if we think they don't belong, then how can we heal these emotions? How can we heal the hurt? So do make sure you give these things space because they're going to come up if they need to and uh, it's not for us to say what should or shouldn't come up in our practice. That's up to nature, that's up to the conditions that are beyond our control. So, um, yeah, there's quite a bit more to say. <laughs> I always end up with too much content, but anyway, I did want to talk a little bit about, we've talked about the objects, but I wanted to talk about the, um, the phrases as well and um, how we can choose these phrases. So, as I said in the guided meditation, um, it's important to choose phrases that actually mean something to you. And I gave some examples of classic sort of loving-kindness phrases like may you be happy, may you be safe, may I be safe, may you be healthy, may you be at peace. So they kind of cover general uh, wishes for well-being, some physical, some mental, some spiritual as well. I love the idea of contentment. I think that's one of the deepest qualities we can cultivate. It's also... The goal of the holy life, the goal of the spiritual path is absolute, utter contentment and peace. Contentment is even a bit deeper than peace, I think. I'll leave that with you to, to ponder. <laughs> but uh, to choose phrases that mean something, and, and I like to choose phrases that rhyme a little bit. I mean, maybe it sounds a bit corny when you speak it to others. <laughs> But I found that it just tends to soothe the mind. It's rhythmic. It's maybe because I'm quite musical. I like something that's rhythmic and that sounds nice and, and that sounds soothing. And apparently, you know, using a soothing tone also does um, stimulate certain centers in the brain, like the centers responsible for care and connection and, and relaxation. So there's something about the tone of voice that you use. And uh, my little four phrases that I've been using for many years have now got an association of love and kindness attached to them for me. So that as soon as I start to say, may I be happy, may I be free, it's like, oh, I'm doing love and kindness. The body and the mind know it and there's a certain happy association. So the meta starts quite easily. Um, but that's four phrases, that's quite a lot and you might just want to stick with a couple you might want to change them from time to time according to need. And I was happy this morning when a couple of you said that phrases spontaneously popped up, which can happen, especially outside the sitting. But for the sitting itself, it might be good to um, choose one or two or three or four <laughs> at the beginning and see if you can stay with them because it's that regularity that also starts to calm the mind and become an object of samadhi. So in the same way that often the object of samadhi is the breath, because it's rhythmic, it's continuous, it's stable. We try to make these phrases rhythmic, continuous and stable, somewhere that our mind can land. We don't have to think about them too much, but we do try to participate and invest them with meaning and invest them with energy, not let them become rote and meaningless and just words going on in the back of your mind while you're thinking about something else, right? So from time to time, we need to re-establish the connection with those phrases. And also, um, as well as the tone, noticing the space and how frequently you need to pop those phrases in. I find in the beginning of the sit, I, it's quite nice to fill my mind up with those words. Maybe because I am quite language and sound-based, I quite like them. 
some people don't like them at all and they actually find it quite easy to do just through a sort of emotional sense or um, even a felt sense of what metta is. But I like to do both because whenever you generate a thought of loving kindness, your mind is completely protected from unwholesome thoughts. And that is quite a big deal. <laughs> like it's literally impossible to have a thought of cruelty or ill will at the time you're having a thought of loving kindness. So at that moment, there is no new bad karma being created. No matter what you're experiencing, whether you're happy or struggling a lot, still, the karma that you're creating now is good and it's going to lead to wholesome results. Maybe when you least expect it, maybe not in the sitting, maybe in the middle of the night. I remember um, in Massachusetts last year, I was having a lot of health troubles. In fact, it was only, no, it's this year. <laughs> it was in Ju July, not that long ago. <laughs> a lot happens in my life. Um, and I had a big flare-up of my disease, like terrible burping, like for hours and hours, like you've heard nothing, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and this really lovely gentleman who I didn't know came up and he just gave me a, a cup of hot water and I was feeling really kind of embarrassed and ashamed because it's so loud and disruptive and this is a totally silent retreat centre over there, <laughs> Forest Refuge, it's just for long retreats and it's always in silence, 12 months a year, 24 hours a day. So I was feeling like, oh, I can't really stay, you know. And he gave me this cup of hot water, which was nice, because normally people just ignore each other on those kind of retreats. And then that night I went to sleep, and there was a massive thunderstorm, really, really massive thunderstorm. I mean, over, over there when it's humid and, you know, the climate's quite intense, it's, it's loud. So it would, bam, waking you up again. <laughs> like, really loud. And I would wake up several times in the night with a jolt. And then it was amazing. The first thoughts that would come up were thoughts of love and kindness without any intention to practice them. And I related it directly to that person giving me the hot water that day. Because I just took in the love and kindness and my mind was primed in that way. So although I woke up with a jolt, there was no fear. There was just loving kindness present all night long. It was beautiful. Mm. So it's amazing how these things come to help you when you most need them. And uh, yeah, the other point about that, which leads into the last point really, is um, the patience. You know, I, I really love this analogy of planting seeds. That's a really nice... Uh, simile to use that you're kind of tilling the soil first of all your body you can consider as the soil in this analogy so you're kind of relaxing it softening it noticing what's going on you're kind of seeing what's what's happening there you know like kind of raking through soil and you're making it loose you're making it moist with your kindfulness <laughs> or heartfulness someone said earlier that's nice as well but the the mindfulness and the kindness helps to soften everything up and then you're planting these seeds which are the phrases in the soil of the heart and moistening them you know shining on them with your caring attention in between each phrase the silence that's there the fact that that silence is infused with loving kindness you're kind of directing your mind very gently in that way and um, eventually those seeds start to sprout and uh, we talked about that this morning but another simile that came to mind was uh which is related, really, to not stretching the plants, is that uh, in Perth a few years ago, I'm always there for the rains retreat, and the rains retreat ends in Australian springtime. And in Western Australia, there are so many wildflowers. It's absolutely spectacular, if you look, because they're tiny. But once you see them, you see them absolutely everywhere. And the amazing thing is, they come up in this pattern so that one day, like, two or three different kinds of orchids will suddenly come out and there'll be a certain colour. And then in the next couple of days, three or four more plants come out. <laughs> and in the next few days, a few more. And they all come out from these really scrappy, crispy, spiky bushes that you think have no promise whatsoever. You think, you know, you just walk past them, you don't even see them, you think it's just dead stuff. And suddenly they produce the most delicate, incredible tiny little flowers some with a shimmer 
some with kind of little fringes on the edge. And they're all just so unique. And what I realised is that they come out in their own time. You know, suddenly all the yellow ones, and then a few days later all the blue ones. And I've never once looked at those flowers and thought, the yellow ones are superior to the blue ones, because they came first. (laughs) You know, I've never thought that. They all come according to their own mysterious laws. Seasonal changes. They, they flower in their own time. And that's just like this practice. It doesn't flower when we press a button or when we shift from one category to the next. They flower when the causes and conditions are ripe. And if somebody's experiencing lots of loving kindness in this retreat by now, that doesn't mean you're a superior bush. <laughs> it just means that it's your season to flower. You know, if you don't flower until three or four years, Or if you never flower in this lifetime, it really doesn't matter because you're directing the mind towards wholesome states. My first teacher used to say, Kalam Agameya is a Pali word. It means let the time ripen, let the time ripen. You just do your job of cultivating the garden, planting the seeds, you know, shining on the sun, and you just let the time ripen. You don't know when it's going to be, and it doesn't really matter, because if you enjoy the cultivation, you enjoy the gardening, you enjoy planting those seeds, then you're already pretty happy, right? The rest is just a bonus. So this whole thing is a process of transforming our old habits into new good habits, and whatever's arising at any given moment is the result of our past karma. But I really love how Ajahn Brahm um, (coughs) describes meditation. Sometimes he says it's making good mental karma. That's what we're doing in our practice. And that mental karma is the right intention. Karma is intention, the Buddha said. Chetana aham kammam vadami. It means intention, I say, is karma. So every time we're aligning our intention with goodwill, with loving kindness, with non-harm, thoughts of care, thoughts of benevolence, Thoughts of letting go and giving things to others. Every time we're doing that, we're creating really good, wholesome karma in our minds. We're planting beautiful seeds. And uh, that's all we can ever do. That's all we can do. And as well in the suttas, it says that, you know, when you um, have a mind that's full of good qualities, it's like the mind is really wide, it's really vast. And if some past old karma comes up that's negative or harmful you know maybe a thought of a traumatic event when it comes up in a huge lake you know in a huge mind and that mind is resourced it has capacity it has loving kindness there then the effect will be very minimal the impact won't shake you or break you in any way he likened this to putting uh, salt in a big lake he said if there's this big salt crystal and you put it in a big lake it doesn't have any you know taste If you put the same salt crystal, the same event, into a small cup of water, it's very, very salty. So in the same way, uh, the old past karma, the old hurts, or whatever it is that you haven't worked out, you know, and it could be anything that comes up. It can be things that happen to us now in our life. That is like the salt, but depending on the size, the scope, the breadth, and the quality of your mind, it will have a different impact. So our job is to keep our minds um, in a good relationship with ourselves, with others around us, and with whatever we have to do, Uh, whatever situation happens, you know, how are we relating to it? Can we relate to it with loving kindness, with metta, with patience? Patience is an aspect of gentleness and non-cruelty, you know. I think it's easier to be kind than to be patient. You can be kind, but you can want things now, And that's not gentle. That's making demands. So this whole path is a process. And it does go from the surface level of the mind to the subconscious mind or the deeper levels of the mind. So it will highlight areas that are still um, unresolved. And that's a good thing, you know, because they're there anyway. You just don't normally notice. And I thought it was beautiful how someone said this morning that, you know, they had this caricature of the hobby and the things that (laughs) they'd done wrong or their faults. It's the mind being playful about how it processes things 
And, uh, and I think that's really wonderful. It comes up because you're strong enough to see it and also um, relate to it with kindness. And I thought it was really beautifully playful and, uh, and probably quite healing as well. So um, I think that's probably enough for now, and it's your tea time as well. In fact, I've talked longer than I expected, as usual. Um, mm -hmm. But hopefully some of that is useful, and uh, whatever is not needed, don't worry about it. It's planted, and it will come to help you at just the right time. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So now you may have loving kindness towards your supper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>